Hello gamers and welcome to another exciting edition of Game Warp. I'm Melwood. I'm Kim. And tonight we're talking about Little Nightmares 2. Uh, Little Nightmares 2 is the much anticipated follow-up to the original Little Nightmares from Tarsim Studios. A game that's made the top of our list and it still remains one of the great underplayed hidden gems. I think it's up there with Oxen Free of one of those games that you just wish everyone was playing yet. For whatever reason, people have just not really discovered it. So it brought us great delight to know that there was going to be a sequel coming out. And currently this is expected, if we're to believe Tarsum Studios at least, to be the final game in uh, the Little Nightmares saga of two games. So it's um, time now to obviously find out. Are we going out on a high note? Are we going out on a low note, really? But um, Kim, opening thoughts on Little Nightmares 2. Opening thoughts, I guess, it would be more... <laughs> Little Nightmares 2 is um, is a lot... I think I think as, as starting is, uh, is a lot harder than the first game. Um, but it also has a lot more variety to it, I would say. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, enemies and... Um, the world is a lot bigger because now you're not just in a little ship called the Maw, right? You're in no. uh, the Pale City, which is a big setup where you're going through different settings in the city and what has kind of uh, invaded this uh, this city right now, uh, and and like what's happened to the city and what's happened to the people in this kind of dilapidated world that they live in. Yeah, I mean, this time uh, we play as a little boy named Mono, who um, along the, along his journey uh, to the Pale City teams up with our protagonist from the original game six, the little girl in the yellow raincoat. And I have to say that when you first introduced uh, six again, um, and I'm going to just say right now that he's going to be spoilers ahead, but uh, we're going to save the big furries to the end of this uh, review, but... First off, I mean, when we're introduced to Six, she's just this little girl that you find in the woods, and she's got a little music box, and I had no idea it was Six. Yes, um, yes. But for the longest time, I just thought, it's like, oh, you're just these two kids, you're going through this world, and then she finds a little raincoat, and it's like, oh my god, you were Six all along. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was quite a... Quite a fanboy fro. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing is, like, because uh, I, I did read some of, like, the descriptions before I started. So in most descriptions, they do say mono and six. Yeah. So I, I did know it was six in the beginning. But it is such, like, a rewarding moment when, because you're looking at this right now. And r right now, because she doesn't have a raincoat, you automatically know this is a prequel to the first game. And... Uh, when she gets her raincoat, you're just kind of like, oh, wow, what is this end game? Are we going to, like, is the end game, like, somehow she's going to go to the Maw or something, right? Uh, end up in the Maw at some point. But we never actually end up, you know, at that point. Um, as I'm not going to talk about the end of the game, but that's not that's definitely not the end game <laughs> that I expected. Can I just, can I just interrupt you there a minute? I love the fact that you conned on to the fact this was a prequel well before I did. It was not until the right into the end that I was like, oh, wow, we've been playing a prequel all this time. I thought, this is a sequel. I was like, how did Six end up in the woods? It's all like, what's happened? Because when we last saw her, she was like this all-powerful being who left the moor. She stole the lady's powers. And now she's like, you know, she's been captured in the woods. It's like, what's uh, going on here? So, Well, no, because the thing is that well, obviously, it's. I didn't know it was a prequel until um, until we found the raincoat. But it's easy to because it's mm. easy to say that it's either she lost her raincoat or or whatnot, <laughs> right? But the moment that confirms it is when we find the raincoat. It means that she didn't have it the whole way. It was really um, during this process that we found it. And I think okay. that you know, at, when the two games like the fact that I think one of the smart gates, the smart movements uh, of, of, uh, of choice here in the game is really to bring Six as your second character. Um, she's kind of like a partner in crime, like a little companion that you get to uh, <laughs> that you, that gets to like, run after you and stuff like that. And, well, you do a lot of running after her because she gets abducted a lot. 
Yeah, you, you do a lot of the heavy lifting here because while we had originally fought with the initial screenshots of this and you got the two characters that we thought maybe it would be like Unravel 2 where you would uh, get to, you know, you and a friend would get to go for this world. But no, Six gets kidnapped a lot and you do a lot of the heavy lifting here. But thankfully, she's not a broken AI character like we've seen every other time this mechanic's been used, such as um, Resident Evil 5, where your partner is essentially just a... A really handy caddy, more than any one that's going to provide you any interest. But no, six is the times that uh, you use six in the in the game. I've, I've work really well because she's there to you know provide a boost and to uh, help pull open heavier doors and even um, help you fire a shotgun at one point, which is a pretty fun moment. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 really. Um... I think it's, it's really nice because, you know, we played a six as the first game. So it's kind of like a familiar character to us at this point. Obviously, after she gets her raincoat, she becomes even more familiar. And it, it doubles the fear here, right? In, on one hand, you get to, you know, go hand in hand with her. I love that whole mechanic where you can, like, hold her hand and then run. Oh, yeah. I just only discovered it, like, right at the end. But it was like, oh, that's so adorable. Yeah, because if, um, if you actually hold her hand and run for a certain amount of time you actually get an achievement i actually ran with her holding her hand a lot because sometimes she would just like toil behind really slowly in some parts or something and i wouldn't i wouldn't understand what was going on and then um, and then and then it would i would just yeah. carry her along with me sometimes like just pull her along and run um i noticed she didn't really have that dawdling mechanic whenever you get a chase sequence because she seems like twice as fast yeah, as you are yeah 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 pretty much because like because what what's really good about Six's character is she's not useless. In so, in many, many ways, when you're in a chase scene or something with her, she actually is leading the way. So you actually have someone to guide you through um, the path that you need to go. And a lot of times when she, when you need to get certain puzzles done or, or where you need to go next, she's actually a good um, point to follow as to what your next step should be because she's usually going to be facing in that direction or or you'll call out her name if you need her help and then because when you need her help she'll pretty much offer it right away once you've interacted with the object so or even before you interact with an object so it, it's it's really nice the way that they've designed her like there, there are certain points where she'll follow you to a certain point and then she'll get into like, like the boosting movement the boosting type of uh um stance or whatever uh and you know it's it, it's really i think it's really fun just the fact that you know you have someone that's with you the whole time and it's not as crazy but at the same time you kind of wonder whether having someone <laughs> like when we're in the first part it's really crazy because what happens to six automatically kills mono so when you're trying to like escape through a hole and <laughs> you jump in and then you don't get the time for her to jump in and she gets shot then you get shot pretty much so <laughs> yeah i mean the whole world that this game takes place in is really is is as fun as the more was i mean obviously with the more it was a one central location and you were basically working your way up from the basement to the dining hall and avoiding various bosses along the way and we were game with this game it follows a similar path only this time you're since you're going you're just going on this journey so you start off in the woods and then you're in a school and you go through a um a hospital and each new location as you travel to the pale city brings with it this host of interesting characters no location two locations are exactly the same and there's constantly these new and interesting villains for you to encounter um along the way as well as new mechanics such as when you're in the hospital you have to outwit a bunch of statues that uh, will only move with the lights not on them very weeping wait weeping angels-esque mm -hmm. uh, or five nights at freddy's if you uh want a more gamer sort of reference there and um again with the flashlight mechanic it's the fact that you can use the jewel sticks to use the second jewel stick to control where you shine the flashlight um is it, it all these new mechanics they add to the game just work so well and add all these new levels to the game. It's not like uh, Tom Sears Studios just set out and was like, okay, we're just going to do the first game again and put it in a new location. Here they're clearly trying new tricks and new 
puzzles especially um i found this game to be a lot more heavier on its puzzles than yes. the first game was uh the first game felt like very sort of linear it was sort of like a straightforward story that you were play through uh was this one the puzzles there's a number of times where i got pretty stumped as to trying to figure out where things needed to be or where i needed to go so yeah because i think i think it is like the game really does level up on the difficulty or the depth of the puzzles as you go forward when you start at the beginning they're 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 fairly straightforward you know move this over somewhere or you need to do something or um you know you know you get killed once or twice or something and then you'll figure it out or you know they have these traps in the schools and you have all those little um shock moments right but at the end it it really is just a, a like a battle of the wits type of thing you're going around and you're getting into the the pale city and then all of a sudden you realize what powers mono has and then and then you need to figure out you know this whole elaborate puzzle of how to warp through TVs and, and how to not die through there and and draw away these like I, they call it the viewers I think um, of, of people who are just brain dead obsessed with these TVs uh, looking at the TV images and whatnot and it it's it's it is really unnerving in a certain way because it it's it seems like there's a lot of things that when you think about it it's reflects like an exaggerated world that we live in type of thing you know where people are obsessed with TV or obsessed with whatever right and it, it's it's interesting how how all this uh, comes together it's a nice touch, isn't it? I mean, the first game is like everyone's obsessed with food yeah. and hunger, and then this one they're obsessed with television. <laughs> it's, 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 so it's like the addiction theme just continues over. Um, and again, with these these mechanics that we have in the game, I mean, it's not just the increased puzzles. There's more fighting moments yes. as uh, Mono is able to use like axes to open doors or pipes to bash in certain <laughs> characters' heads. Uh, which is fine because they're all porcelain. Uh-huh. It's all fine, um, but it you, each of these worlds, it's not. Don't feel like you're just battling through levels. It feels like you're actually going through different worlds. Yes. Um, and I love that, like when you go in the school, you've got all these like Home Alone style traps that keep flying down, and you've got these porcelain school children that are trying to attack you, or. Again, when we go into uh, the city and you've got these people who are just sort of like addled on uh, on television, so they're just constantly looking at the screens, and you've got to activate screens for to like distract them. Um, and the, w- there's a scene where you actually break a TV in front of them, and they just go into this frenzied mob trying to attack you. So um, it it just constantly was. There's always something new to figure out, something new to try. It just felt the game felt very fresh, just like the whole way through. It never felt like I was just getting a sort of rehash of the first game, which I really sort of appreciated. And um, again, the story this is a story with the only sort of words in it is the fact that you can say hello. <laughs> so uh, a little more talky than the first one. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, you're getting the is unraveling this really sort of complex um, sort of idea and story that's being hinted at the way through, where you see like signs on walls or the way that uh, you have certain encounters, and it's just fun like the first game just to piece it all together. Certainly, yeah, for sure. And and you know, I mean, what really helps is the fact that um, I I mean, I know I know that you didn't play the DLCs, but if you actually played the DLCs, they're they're actually um, like DLCs of the the first game. Um, it actually hints towards in one of the DLCs the bosses, some of the bosses that we encounter in this one. And uh, it, it's interesting that you know Tarzi Studios seems to have already like crafted this world in advance, and I, and I'm actually a little surprised based on you know the different um, the different. Uh, enemy designs that seems to be sitting around that they they're if they stop from they stop at this one um i wonder if they're gonna maybe like i I wonder if they continue if they do decide to continue whether it it might be just through another studio or what whatnot um but that's a you know well we'll discuss that after but i mean like when you talk about the the enemy designs there's so much more this time too you know you the the first one the first chapter in the wilderness is is a lot more straightforward you really just have one 
big enemy and a chase sequence which is kind of like an intro chapter but when you start getting into the other areas you start having all these like you have the big bosses the big boss you know but you also have these little bosses you know uh, where you need to get through you know uh very <laughs> evil dead-esque <laughs> army of darkness or whatever is it no, 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 Evil Dead. It's Evil Dead. Yeah, the, Evil Dead. Yeah, the, the the living hands, and then you have these these poor these um they call it the patients, which is the mannequins that walk around, and then you have like in the school you have bullies, um, which are the little kids that we need to that, that need to be fought off, and when you move forward to the Pale City, it's it's even more of, I think the Pale City is probably the most um big type of world when you're really running through the rooftops of the pale city and you stop at this scene where you're just watching these obsessed people just fall off the roof one by one (laughs) and it's 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 crazy it's so dark and you're just thinking about these kids that need to like this kid that you're playing that's watching all this go on right we well, also have that uh, one of the, the the TV puzzles that when you complete it, a guy like chases the TV off the roof. He's so obsessed with yeah. watching television. So, um, yeah, and I, there's just so many moments that sort of like stand out to me. As you said, that moment where you got people on the roof that are just like throwing themselves off, or like when we're in the school and you're being chased by the school teacher who's got like this snake-like neck, like a and giraffe it's just neck, like, yeah. It's just like it just goes. It just keeps stretching, stretching. Stretch it chases you through the vents, and it's like this just nightmarish creation. Um, I think the game more than lives up to it <laughs> to its title when you see some of these creations that you, you're going to encounter along the way. Certainly, so absolutely. I mean, this game, this game is really intense. Like there are a lot of tense moments. I think because of the first game having really set out type of you know every single chapter had one enemy that you needed to fight and. You just had, like, really straightforward moments. This one is so much more in-depth because you have so many dangers that every single area, you know, when you go into the, the, the hospital and you're looking for the the different, um, what do you call them? <laughs> in Resident Evil, oh, fuses. <laughs> oh, fuses, yeah. 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 <laughs> so <laughs> when you're going through and then you go into different areas to look for the fuses, it's just... It's just like you go in one area, you got hands chasing you. You go into another area, you have you have patience and darkness and flashlights. Oh, that that part was real rough. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> and then you also have um yeah that that great scene where you got to X-ray the teddy bears to find the key, <laughs> and you can mess around behind the, the X-ray machine. I thought that was fun. Yeah, yeah, no, that was really fun. But I think the hospital chapter was really dark because you're you're thinking about mm. it and you and it's just like. I can't remember, did we, we didn't get rid of the teacher, though. No. We just escaped, um, right? We just escaped the teacher. Yeah, the teacher, because we, um, yeah, we we basically escaped the school, and, and you, she, I mean, she's uh, just chasing you through, but no, you fully expect, because that uh, something's going to befall these creations to put an end to it but no but the teacher we just we just escape uh, but the other bosses all meet horrible ends yeah it's safe to say so <laughs> yeah the doctor's was really dark <laughs> oh yeah it's a very handsome Greta, isn't it <laughs> um much like the hunter and i mean there's even like some of the smaller bots the smaller like enemies where you have to like lure them into like uh electric floors and things like that and it's I have to say that there's the moments where when you're in the sea and you've got to like avoid electric floors, it's kind of amusing when you do um, land on yourself and the, his head catches on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not sure was the intention of the the game, but it was it made it a little uh, easier to take when you screwed those moments up. Yeah, I, it's um, just it, it's just you know a lot of a lot of it is so. Um... I think it's just, it's just because you have so many of these different things, so you end up having so many more chase sequences, and you add all that together, and this game is is really um, much more. I guess it's a, there's a good part, there's a good bit of stealth, but there's also a good bit of action, which I think is a step up from the previous game. In many ways, this game just reminds me so much of Inside. Yeah, especially like, when you start, you start out in the forest. <laughs> yeah, you start in the wood avoiding hunters. 
Um, I don't want to say this too much. And you, the fact you're going, you're working your way into like the heart of this conspiracy, and it felt very much the the journey. While obviously very different from each other, it felt like very, the style of storytelling in this one felt very similar to uh, Inside. Whereas like the first, I suppose you could say like the first game was kind of like Limbo in that way. The fact that it was very sort of like. Um, just working your way through one location whereas obviously with Inside it branched out that scope and obviously we see the same here with Little Nightmares 2 where it's just branching out the scope, it giving a whole city to explore and even like when you look at the locations we have a lot more we have a much more of a 3D plane whereas before it, before it was just very much like a 2D side scroller sort of environment well, and this more, one it, was a, can... it was always a 2.5D but now you have more of a depth to your areas so you can actually go further back than before and you can actually go more in the 3d motion where your your halls are fully explorable on one direction whereas before it was really it was more of a side scroller like a, a more 2d than 2.5 this is more like yeah. 2.5 moving to three you know so now you know because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know when i can discover that but yeah that's the that's the uh, proper explanation of what it was. So, <laughs> my my fake expression. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, collectibles game, and this one is also up. So you can now collect a number of different hats. So if you want to wear a teddy bear hat or a postal hat, you can. <laughs> Makes no difference to the gameplay, but it's fun to collect these things. I actually, I actually thought it's pretty interesting because when I collected hats and it would fit in a certain area, I would actually wear yeah. them more. So. When oh, I, really? Yeah, so when I got, like, the, the coonskin hat from the, the hunter's hut, uh, house, I, I would wear that as I'm going through the forest because it seems to make you, in, in my mind, it felt <laughs> like I blended better. Okay. Yeah, and then, and then when just... you're in the kitchen, I had the, the tin can hat. So that it, was, it would be more like you're going through, like, the cafeteria of, of the school, and then I would have that on, and it would make me feel like it kind of blended together. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really like the box hat. Which is the one that you have? I just, for, even though I had other hats there, I, I put them on just to see what they look like. But I always stuck with the box. I think the box is, it's as iconic a design as Six's yellow raincoat. Yeah, I think. But it, the simplicity of it is just so good. It, it just works. Yeah. Well, and also it also kind of like follows the trend of our characters being kind of faceless. Um, obviously, this time we see the face of of of, of Six now. Um, but I mean, I just, I just couldn't resist it. Uh, when, when I picked up the, the yellow hat and I just kept it until like, until, uh, I, I only used it after, uh, six got back her raincoat and then it would be like matching kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. But it, in, by, by the end of the game, it kind of makes sense why he wears the box, why all his hats and cover his face. So. But uh, we're getting to theories, as I said, uh, at the end of this uh, this review. But no, I think it's um, a game well worth um, checking out. Um, even better, it's on Stadia at the moment, so it's like something worth using your Stadia trial for. <laughs> Can't say there's anything else I really enjoyed. Oh no, Rain was pretty good on on Stadia, but uh, yeah, that's a way to to play it until it obviously turns up on one of the game passes uh, inevitably in the future. Yeah, I mean, just the you know for the collectibles. Other than the hats, there's also um, there's also the glitch remains, which are these uh, these little things that you uh, these little kind of static creatures, characters, kids. I don't know what you call that you find. Yeah, they're and, like silhouettes, um, aren't they? Yeah, and and as you're as you, and if you're able to find all of them, which I actually found, uh, I actually missed a lot of them. Um, well, a good few of them. Um, it unlocks a secret ending, so it's kind of an extension of the ending that you of the original ending. It's kind of like an ending that follows after the original ending happens. Okay, should we get into fairies then? Sure. Okay, so if you collect all the silhouettes, um, as Kim said, you do get the full ending of the game. And one of the the great things about the, about this this game, obviously, the whole time you're playing through, you're being pursued by this new villain who's called the Tall Man, um, who's basically like, you know, he's kind of like your stereotypical man in black. Slender um, Man. It's so, kind of like a that yeah. Slender Man type of design. Um, and the whole way through, he's like trying to trying to contact 
trying to you know figure out who you are and at the same time you are looking into the tvs along the way and it gives you visions of this door that you're constantly trying to head to and by the end of the game we find out that we've actually been just doing something that's called full circle because mono is actually the tall man and what you've been basically doing the whole whole time is trying to break the circle cycle so that mono doesn't become the tall man you realize he covers his face because everyone is trying to kill him um because <laughs> they recognize that he's going to grow up to become the tall man but in terms of uh six at the end of the game when uh she ultimately betrays you yeah. what did you make of uh that <laughs> well i mean it, it's sort of like it's sort of like you bastard. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Like, because you're you're doing this and you're just watching this really dramatic moment as you're you finally made your escape in this final big chase, right? Yeah. And you've saved you just finished saving six from her giant self and then making your escape, you jump through this thing and it's super epic, and then she doesn't pull you up this time. And yep. it's, I, I think, I, well, that's one of the things we forgot to mention is like six is really useful because she, she also is a, a mechanic in this one where, where six actually essentially helps you, um, helps catch you in very long distances that you jump. And it's, it's just, it, it, it is like, it's really crazy because you're, <laughs> it's very mixed feeling, right? Because you're, you're playing this and you start thinking, well, I mean, why did Six do it? Is it because essentially she knows that you will never escape this? Or is it because she figured out that you're the tall man or thin man or whatever you call it? I've, I've, re I've read different ways of how you say it. And then, or, or is it that this is just her nature, right? I don't know. Like, what, what, what is the, you know, what is Six's, I think in the end, the story turns more, it is, we play mono the whole time, but in the end, the story still dials back down to Six and her motives, right? I think Six and her motives definitely play into the end game. I mean, certainly the the battle between uh, mono and the, the Finn man, uh, or the tall man, uh, whatever way you want to describe <laughs> the, the big villain of this piece, is ultimately his his fight and every time you look going to the tv sequence and he's pulled back you notice it's six who pulls him back yeah so that's what's constantly pulling back and at the same time we've got to remember that six is a survivor so the fact that she sees herself constantly being put in peril by the actions of mono and by following him around she realizes that in her mind that she only really needs to absorb some of his uh, power so she can escape the static world which is essentially what we can see at the end either that or she's just a really big Lion King fan um, read into it what you want but that enables her to escape this escape the signal and the tower and essentially um, this plays into if you get the true ending where she essentially is you see her like escape into this room and there's a poster on the floor for the moor and it essentially leads into her going to the moor. Um, and this explains why she doesn't have any of her powers that she has at the end of the first game, and at which point you realise, unless you're a genius like Kim, that you've been playing a prequel all the time, which I thought was uh, was just a really nice twist. But yeah, with, um, with Six, it's always been about... Her end game has always been about using Mono to essentially escape this world and she sees that opportunity then to drain some of his power because he's obviously able to escape the static realm which she's unable to do and he she um, uses that to escape through the door and essentially leaves him to become the the uh the fin man which we see at the end he falls to the bottom of the tower and he sits on the chair and basically restores the tower to its original form because at this point it's turned into that big monster and uh, we see with the flashes forward as he becomes, you know, the tall man. And obviously, when it comes to the words, you get the coats and fedora back. It's, you know, it's an aesthetic choice. <laughs> but yeah, his whole game is that he wants to break this cycle. But yeah. each time he comes to encounter with his younger self, he's more powerful as his younger self than he is as his, his adult self. So he, the circle keeps repeating itself. And the hope is obviously that Six would be the one to help break the cycle, but ultimately she has her own agenda because she's a survivor. Mm. Um, and that's why she escapes the realm and leaves him still in his circle. 
And this also explains why he's obviously so determined to save her the whole time that we obviously just perceive as being this friendship because you know she gets kidnapped a fair bit in the school and the, the uh, surgery and stuff which I mean really isn't going to warm you to anyone as a travelling companion so but uh, yeah that's that's what I took away from it anyway so no I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from I mean it, it kind of also explains that it hints to why Six suddenly has all these um because if you're talking about, you know, absorbing Mono's powers, he just needs a bit of his powers. You think that maybe a part of it is that that's her power, that she's able to absorb absorb power from other people? And yeah. and that's why we get that, you know, that last moment in, in the first game where she's walking down and she's a- absorbing all this stuff. Like, uh, I think she's attracting all this. I can't remember the first game that much, the ending, but... Um... The ending, she um, basically pounces on on the the woman yeah. um who's uh or the lady isn't it yeah, yeah, um, yeah. who's the geisha yeah. and absorbs her power because she's a very powerful sort of sorceress being and then we see her basically walking through the dining hall and out to the exit and basically everyone collapsing around six someone i forgot to mention as well is that when she bursts with the tv we see part of her soul um yeah. disappear as part of those transitions which would essentially be the good six disappearing and it leaves her with this hole in her, herself and this unrelenting hunger which obviously plays so much into the first game yeah. this unquenchable hunger that she's trying to uh to quench which we obviously mistook as just her refusal to eat anything because she knows where the sausage comes from <laughs> in the first game which is obviously in the first game they're making um Food, they're making sausage out of children. Yes. Uh, but obviously it's, it was never the case. It was just her about trying to fill that void that's obviously left uh, in her as the, the cause of her actions. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the thing is that because of all the questions that you have in, in the first game, the second game is actually feels a little bit more confirmed. As in, especially mm. when you're talking about Mono. Mono's intentions feels um, less vague than when we were trying to do theories for Six in the first one because of how it ended and who is this little girl and what are these powers and, you know, why is oh, she, yeah, you know, we... what does she have for, for you know, uh, the gnomes and, and what is all that? And, <laughs> and, and obviously, like, the gnomes, um, I mean, not obviously for you because you didn't play it, but <laughs> the DLCs really <laughs> gives you a good um, picture of the gnomes um, in two of the DLCs. Okay. Yeah, so it really gives you a... It, it's also very, like, if you ever get the chance, it, it's really worth playing. Um, it also increases in difficulty than, in, than the original game, but adds a lot of depth to the story in the Maw that we're, we, we've experienced. And uh, in this one, it's kind of, I, I think... In terms of narrative, I, I'm I'm a big fan of stories that go full circle. So, <laughs> obviously, Mono's story is really um, it, fascinating because you realize that he's going in this cycle. It's just a cycle that he's going through that he's trying to break. And, and when he's going through the city, it's essentially he's experiencing the world collapsing because of him, essentially, right? Because of, you know, the transmissions and all that stuff that's going on. And I, I just I just think that the story is fascinating because of you you have to it's like you know you you're able to craft this story about who six is now um, just from that one motion of betrayal and then her obsession with her music box and and that sort of thing and then it kind of reminds you that you know this six that you're seeing that's been pulled back into the TV it it's also kind of like a two version type of story right you have the 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 tall man or thin man or whatever and you have him pulling six into the the screen which is kind of trying to stop him kind of to save her to to save save the i don't know mono from from turning into this this creature but then at the same time once you fall back into this thing and you're trying to save her she turns into the the first moment that you see her with the as you saved her from the 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 hunter's shack or whatever and when she's playing with a music box and she's essentially doing the same thing and it almost feels like this music is uh, this music and six in her music box is is something that's also a cycle and i i just i just think it's it's so fascinating how 
how, like, over the two games, and you get a clearer picture, kind of, of, like, what you said, like, Six is a survivor, and, you know, a lot of her actions you can kind of understand, but at the same time, like, because you've played Mono for, for the entire game, you kind of have to side with him a little, and can't help but feel a little betrayed when she lets go of you. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it, this is the the problem because you get so attached to the character you play because yeah. that's the journey you t- you take. So you are so invested in this character and you want them to succeed because you know in our mind we've been programmed that when we play games the idea is that for our actions we we help the characters succeed. We don't play games for them to like <laughs> to lose. <laughs> we're not we're not used to down endings in video games. We're kind of used to down endings in 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 movies, perhaps. But uh, in video games, we we want we play games to win. Yes, this is the way. Like any game you play, you play to win. You, you play don't to like survive. Things. You play to make it out alive, right? At the end yeah. of the adventure, you you plan to be the hero of it, or at least you know some form of <laughs> survival, right? It's it's even like you go to you break this down to like just the base level. If you play snakes and ladders, you don't play to be like the person who doesn't win. You play to be the person who wins the game. It's like any game you play, you play. This is the way we've been programmed for yeah. this very young age. Just believe that you play games to win. And if we're going to when we look at something like Inside, which has a very sort of open ending, it still feels like kind of a win because we can believe that is our that he escapes. At least in our mind, we can convince ourselves so. But with this, it's no, it's we're stuck in this ever ending loop. It just <laughs> never ends. The only real winner here is Six, and we're not even playing as her. <laughs> well, I mean, you could think that we're, we are kind of playing as her because, okay. you know, we are going through this journey almost completely with her. And, you know, while you do face a lot of the adventures yourself, I mean, Six is six is a big part because we've played six before. So in some ways, our connection with six is still there, at least for me, because I was really, really, um, you know, I mean, people who know me know I'm a big fan of, of the character of six um, from the yeah. character design to the mystery behind her and to, you know, the 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 intentions and, and just her character that she's gone through from, from the first game and, and throughout and all these things that she's had to experience. Um, when you get to this game, it's it's such a welcoming thing to see her back again, even though you can't play as her. And and she is, in many ways, you know, so helpful and everything. And you just, it's just, you it's kind of like you feel like, you expect her to help you and then you don't understand why she doesn't and that's why you know we can have this whole theory about in the end that it's very clever for the developers to write a story like this because not only are they messing with your mind in the sense that you don't make it out alive in that sense um you're you're stuck in this vicious cycle uh but at the same time you're you're also connected with this character of six which you're not playing but yet because you're so familiar with the first story that now it kind of builds up her character and you can you know I think I think it's a it's gonna be a mixed camp as to who stands up for six and who doesn't because I mean in the end six betraying mono is mm-hmm. seems like such a bad thing and yet like how you explain it it's it's understandable because she's a survivor and she's going to do what she needs in order to survive no matter how bad it feels and maybe she knows that he's the th- that mono is a thin man or maybe he she doesn't and yet to... her point is that she needs to escape yeah you also got to realize that it's not just mono she screws over but she screws over the world yeah because the whole city is enslaved under the the power of the signal which is obviously controlled by the fin man yes and this is the whole thing by him breaking it it means that everyone's been freed but by six going no i'm not gonna help you (laughs) i'm out of here it basically means everyone still slaves to the tv and i mean you the, the you can even dive deeper into this like when we go look at the previous previous worlds and we go to like the school the fact that all these children are in porcelain bodies yeah and we go to the hospital and we see the doctor who is transferring souls into different into these mannequin bodies as a way to it could be read as a way to avoid them being enslaved to the signal yeah 
and these are characters that we perceive as being evil because of obviously the the, the way that we see them yes. but in a way they are being freed and then they see mono and a chance to stop mono and and free themselves um but unfortunately you know we're just too powerful too crafty and there uh, <laughs> we keep fraud them at every turn but yeah there's a lot to be read into this this world and i just love i just love the creativity of it i yeah. think it's just beautifully designed it's super fun to play through and here you're having a story that's not relying on 40 minute cut scenes it's just a story that tells itself with just the very simple actions and just the journey that you take and i yeah. think it's just uh it's a series i would really love to play more of and i really hope that two little nightmares 2 isn't the end note for this yeah. series because i think it's just it's just such getting started an honestly it's just getting started because you're you're seeing this world that's so big and there seems like there's so many more stories that you can tell from this world and and especially when you're looking at Six, you really don't really know that much about her. And even if you no. introduce new characters or whatnot, it it really gives you a, a new perspective every single time of this world and just the darkness that is surrounded. Maybe, you know, the next setting is not going to be the Pale City. It could be something else. And it could be another city that's under the influence of another creative addiction um exaggerated to a different type of darkness there's a lot to to uh, yeah a lot that you know if, if the developers really want to that they they definitely can go much further especially you know with the different types of um character designs and enemy designs and all that and and you know i think that I really, I really like, I, I really didn't think about it that way, but I like how you said that, you know, they're chasing him because, because they know, you know, his, his, what he's capable of. And in the end, I think the, the, I think the thing that I didn't realize is that thinking back, of it, that makes a lot of sense is that all these people are trying to, you think they're evil, but they're not, which is a really interesting thing because we, we think we're fighting enemies, but yet they, they are, everything they're doing is to create like new creatures that are not like like new beings that are not uh, subjected to this to this transmission signal thing yeah and i didn't realize that until now so good point just to go back obviously back into our review sort of mode here the end moments of this this game building up to the final showdown with the fin man I think are just some of my favorite gaming moments of this year, if not of the last few years, where you're going through a train carriage and yeah. then we get to this final sort of face off and he takes his box off and you see the box float away and yeah. you just see these two characters stare each other down and it's like, wow. And then you realize that, you no, know, he's had power all this time. <laughs> um, I thought it was just uh, a really simple but just a, a fantastic moment and just uh, how that train sequence is just just handled. I mean, it's up though with um, Uncharted 2's sort of train sequence. Yeah. Certainly better than Katana Zero's train sequence, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I think uh, this is I like like the first game. I think this is going to be so many, there's so many elements of this to puzzle over. People are going to have their own theories on this, so don't take what we're saying as being gospel. This is just our opinion on what happened you know let us know what your opinions are we would love to uh hear what you have you think of the uh the game and and certainly what you think is supposed to be happening so um anything else you want to bring up on this one kim no i'm good um so yeah i've as i said it's uh a, a real thumbs up title for myself um i'm guessing the same for yourself kim Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I I really liked. It. I thought there were some like maybe I don't know. If, I can't decide whether it's my controller or if it's just or if it's just the <laughs> game or it's just my incompetency. But um, I had some I had some issues with like um, contact points or like hit points of uh, of of certain um, elements like picking up things. But right. I mean, other than that, it was you know I think that the immersion i felt with this game it it was really you know once you picked it up it was it's so hard to put down and we always review games and we talk about games that you know you pick up and put down easily and it's so rare you know we find a game that 
we pick up and it's just so hard to leave the game sometimes. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the main thing with like Little Nightmares, no matter if it's the first one or the second one, which I fully intend on playing again just to, you know, um, get all of the collectibles and stuff like that. It's 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 one of those rare games which I really I don't mind going back to experience it even knowing what's gonna happen next even knowing how hard it's gonna be, um, it's just it it's an ex it's it's just such a wonderfully dark world to get in, to get into. So yeah, big big thumbs up on my part. I I really really like it. Awesome. Um, well, that brings us to the end of tonight's episode. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you uh, haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button to wherever you happen to be listening to us, be it on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you happen to be listening to us, uh, you know, do hit those like and subscribe buttons and leave us a review. Let us know what you think in the comment section as it all helps raise the profile of the show. If you haven't done any as, uh, as well, you can also follow us on Facebook and we're on Instagram as well. And uh, you can check out full archive of episodes at gameworldblog.wordpress.com as well, which has got our full archive of episodes on there as well as other fun pieces of writing as well. Um, but uh, until next time, thank you so much for listening. Thanks to my co-host Kim and uh, we will be back soon. But until then, remember to keep gaming.